Good morning. Today is Friday, August the 27th, 2021. This is the feast day of St. Margaret the Barefooted. A year ago, <clears throat> I created a Facebook group entitled uh, Friends of St. Margaret the Barefoot, Friends Who Like St. Margaret the Barefooted, to honor this remarkable woman. And August 27th is a very special day to me. <clears throat> it was during, it was on this day 45 years ago that I took what I consider a prophetic journey. August 27th, 1976, after having breakfast at a cafe in Wolf City, Texas, I drove through a residential neighborhood to get to a highway leading to Bonham where I attended the Northeast Texas Conference of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. I was living in Teague at the time, and uh, I had, had joined the AME Church a year earlier, but I had not seen the first appointment yet. And I really wanted to pastor, and my bishop asked me to meet him in Bonham for the Northeast Texas Annual Conference. I left Teague and drove through Fairfield and Corsicana towns I'd been through many times, or been to many times. Went through Ennis for the first time, stopped and bought gas in Kaufman, then went through Terrell, uh, Greenville, and then stopped in Wolf City and had breakfast. I remember eating some good pancakes that morning. And then, uh, after I left there, I went to Bonham where I learned I was being assigned to a church in Dallas, but I would eventually uh, call the, the, the journey prophetic because uh, as it turned out three years later in 1979 I would be appointed to Macedonia Kaufman. I'd stayed there for eight years and then in 2002 I would be assigned to Wayman Chapel Ennis and would stay there for 14 years. Then in 2016, I would be assigned to Bethel Corsicana, where I've been for the last four years, and I hope, I'm pardon me, the last five years. I'm hoping, uh, God willing, to stay there another five years. I'm scheduled to retire in 2026 and return to Fairfield, my wife's hometown. But our uh, it was in Wolf City, this delightful little town, that as I drove through a residential neighborhood leading to Bonham, I understand it's Highway 78, I saw a barefoot lady walk across the street from one house to another. I do not know if she was walking from her house to someone else's house, from someone else's house to her house, or if she was just visiting there and didn't live in either one of those houses. I don't know if she still lives in Wolf City or not, or anything else about her. I just know that she saw no need to put on shoes to walk across the street, and I thought that was quite remarkable. In case she hadn't already figured it out, uh, I have a huge fetish about women's feet and have as far back as I can remember. <clears throat> and as a Christian theologian, I've been able to find, uh, I don't see this as a problem, I don't see this as a vice, I don't see this as anything that's, that's bad, but I think it's something very positive, and it has theological significance. It'd be about 40 years later, I would learn that the 27th of August is the feast day of St. Margaret the Barefooted, a wonderful woman of God. At age 15, Margaret was forced to marry a man who was very abusive to her. She put up with a lot from him, but continued to pray for him. He eventually repented, returned to the church, and died a holy death. For the rest of her life, Margaret devoted her life to prayer, penance, and service to the poor. She wore the simplest and, and cheapest dresses, never again owned a pair of shoes, walking barefooted wherever she went. 365 days per year. I have a strong conviction and have for many years that barefoot Christian women exhibit a unique blend of spirituality and sexuality. 
St. Margaret the Barefooted is recognized by the Roman Catholic Church as the patron saint of brides, widows, persons involved in difficult marriages, and victims of spousal abuse. I proclaim her as the patron saint of all the barefoot women throughout the world and all of the men who love them. By the way, Margaret lived from 1325 to 1395. And here is a drawing of her. <clears throat> the This is a very good book, a novel called The Barefoot Girl by Catherine Munro. And of course, being a novel, it's uh, the Historical accuracy of many parts is questionable, but uh, novelists can take certain liberties uh, historians cannot take. Uh, it's written in first person. Starts out in chapter one, I'm Margarita of San Severino, known as the Barefooted One, an old woman now. I will tell you this story the best way I can. And it was a very interesting discussion. Uh, certain passages marked here that I think are relevant. one point in the li her life uh, she receives a pair of shoes she said at least the shoes were comfortable I felt almost as if I were barefooted until then the only time I'd worn shoes was in winter they were made of wood and were much heavier <coughs> and more uncomfortable than the shoes the senora gave me While married to this very cruel man, a man with some money, she became very concerned about poor people and began to minister to the poor and needy. Um, and to identify with the poor people, many of whom could not afford shoes, she would leave her shoes behind and walk barefooted. And at that time in history, bare feet were seen as uh, associated with poverty, which is very unfortunate. But At first, all they could do was stare at me as if I were some kind of spectacle in my bare feet with my unkept hair. And she was introduced to, the, to a group of poor people. Her name is Margarita. You see, she's come to you barefooted to show her humility, her desire to help. And, but she reached the point uh, says here, just before I reached the marketplace, 
I removed my shoes, wrapped them in my cloak, and stored the bundle behind an old broken stone that looked as if it might have once been of a building. Of course, I was shivering, and I had forgotten the painful cold of damp winter earth beneath my bare feet. A relentless breeze sank deep into my skin. I tried to think not of the cold, but to summon a vision of my two Marys, that is, the Blessed Virgin Mary and St. Mary of Magdalene. As I hurried <coughs> toward the place in the square where I had found people earlier, no vision would come to me, <coughs> but I was trying so hard that for a moment at least I forgot about my cold feet and the raw sting of ice and wind on my arms. Many uh, <coughs> began to regard her as a holy woman, as a type of saint. Years later, she was canonized. After I had shed my cloak and my shoes, I made my way to the market square, where this time I was greeted with eager kindness as well as concern for my bruised face. The book goes into detail about her ministry to the poor about the death of her cruel husband who eventually repented and returned to the church. Someone asked her one time, you wear rags, <clears throat> you walk the winter streets barefooted like the vermin who live around the market square. Why? What's your excuse? The poor, she said. They're calling you the barefoot angel, even the barefoot saint. She became known as Saint Margarita, and some called her Saint Barefoot. Epilogue, reportedly written by a friend, and so ends the account of Margarita of San Severino. It's Margarita the Barefooted. Having grown old in the service of our Lord and waiting my time to enter into the presence of divine intelligence, <coughs> I feel compelled to complete my own poor words with the story of Margarita the Barefooted. May God forgive me for waiting so long. Margarita never ceased humbling herself before the poor by appearing to them barefoot and in rags. Her wealth was apparent only in her generosity. And now being transcribed, her words and this, my unworthy addition, there remains but one more task for me to fulfill before I am taken from this earth. And that is to translate the letter of Colin to Margarita. This is a fictitious story, by the way, of uh, Colin is the name of a Catholic priest who there was definitely some chemistry between Margaret and Colin, and 
there were moments he seemed to even consider renouncing his vow of celibacy and leaving the priesthood, but that did not happen. And at first I thought the letter lost since Margarita never asked me to translate it for her. I would never have intruded upon her privacy by asking her for it. I didn't discover it until several years after her death. It was, as she said years before, beneath the chest that belonged to her and which was transported to me by, at the covenant, at the convent. By some miracle, the abbess allowed me to keep it in my cell, perhaps because she too had heard of the piety of Margaret the Barefoot. As you know, doubt no, it is our privilege to suffer for him who suffered and died for us. And thus it is, I believe, that God set our paths to cross and to taste, however innocently and briefly, the bitter fruits of forbidden love. Now, there's some of us today who don't think such love should be forbidden, but again, that's really irrelevant to uh, this particular uh, video. You know, if celibacy worked as well as it supposed to, that the church would not have all the problem with the abusive priest as it does today, but again, that's a little bit off topic. Uh, back on track with St. Margaret, whether she ever had such a encounter with a priest, I do not know. Again, this is a novel. I cannot forget the beauty of her face, of your face, your lovely eyes, and your most sensuous mouth. As great as your worldly beauty may be, it is your soul that is the most beautiful, which I love with all of my heart, and I confess all of my flesh. I cannot even pray for forgiveness for desiring you. I can only hope that we, that were it not for God's greater design, he could look upon our love and call it good. And this uh, allegedly is the words of this priest uh, who wrote a letter to Margaret expressing his love but recognizing God's greater design was for him to pursue the priesthood and remain celibate. There's not a whole lot of historical information known about this lady. As I say, she lived from 1325 to 1395. And she was, her dad married her off at an early age, like about 15, and the guy she married was very abusive to her. But in the end, he repented and returned to the church and died a holy death. She walked barefooted like the lowest beggar. The different events are seen by different people in different ways. Uh, the church proclaims her as the patron of brides, widows, persons involved in difficult marriages, and victims of spousal abuse all of which are important to recognize, all of which need God's blessings. But for the many barefooted women throughout the world, some who only go barefooted at home, some who do it other places such as in public, a friend of mine in California had a, has a blog uh, called Real Barefoot Girls in which he breaks it down different categories. There's the non-barefoot girl, which uh, is just what the term implies. Uh, a non-barefoot girl, anytime you see her, she's got something on her feet. Shoes, stockings, socks, something or other. The normal barefoot girl is the one that will be barefooted where it's normally expected, relaxing at home, at the beach, at the pool for martial arts and yoga classes and things of, of that nature. But the real barefoot girl is one, is nature's most beautiful creature. She walks the streets, she goes shopping, she eats in restaurants. 
in her bare feet. There's some subcategories that uh, my friend has come up with and he talks about for example the occasional barefoot girl. I wrote him one time about a lady I knew who's now deceased in Teague years ago. Uh, she cared for the elderly and disabled and that's what my job involved and I went to her apartment sometimes uh, on business and she always had her feet covered with something. The only time I ever saw her barefooted was at a local pharmacy downtown. Just the opposite of where, what you would expect. And Matthew said uh, she must have been a, an occasional barefoot girl. The occasional barefoot girl is one that is unpredictable. She'll show up barefooted when you least expect it, but she might also show up in closed-toed shoes on the warmest day of the year. Then there's the category of the accidental barefoot girl who um, I was describing one time uh, I had noticed at wedding receptions sometimes you see girls removing their shoes and he said yes that's a very common venue Matthew said for the accidental barefoot girl gives them an opportunity to dance and have fun without the pain of those shoes and there's the confused barefoot girl I had a student a few years ago who fit in that category she would often take her shoes off and put them right back on uh, she couldn't make up her mind <laughs> so there's a lot of different categories there there there's Margaret was a barefooter and there's websites about different groups of barefooters uh, people who enjoy going barefooted everywhere they go but do not a lot of times they have a disclaimer, this is not a fetish site. And anybody who's looking for that needs to look elsewhere. And, of course, this, this is in the category of both male and female barefooters. Uh, and also, if you hadn't figured it out, my focus is strictly on barefoot females. If you're interested in barefoot males, you come to the wrong place. Moses was a man and he was told by God to take off his shoes because he was on holy ground. But many Christian women down through the years have taken that cue from him. And Margaret carried it uh, to a different level. Uh, she took literally Jesus' words about to his disciples about not having shoes or a staff or anything like that uh, she made her journey and again she lived in medieval Italy um, we don't know that many details about her life but she's so fascinating. She's so awesome. And that's why on August 27th of last year I created this group of friends who like St. Margaret the Barefooted. God bless St. Margaret the Barefooted. God bless all the barefoot women mm -hmm. of the world. God bless all the men who love them. And may God grant a rich and blessed St. Margaret's Day to everyone who listens to this video. Have a great day.